County Health Rankings and Roadmaps has helped to shape the conversation around the social determinants of health uh, as our model for health has become a valued resource for people around the country working to improve the many factors that influence health. In recent years, as we've expanded our rankings and roadmaps resources to focus on equity, uh, our national partnership work is really an important part of this. And we've put an attention and intention towards partnering with other national leaders, such as Unidos US, who support communities most affected by inequities, communities that do not have the same opportunities to be healthy where they live. That said, we are very excited to be co-hosting today's webinar with Unidos US to hear about how they are building a culture of health for Latinos in communities around the country. We'll hear from them on how they support national and local program and advocacy work. And we'll hear from one of their all-star affiliates, La Clinica del Pueblo, which is based in our nation's capital. The County Health Rankings and Roadmaps program is based at the University of Wisconsin Population Health Institute uh, and is a collaboration with the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. Uh, and at this point, uh, I just wanna introduce myself. My name is Justin and I'm a network strategist based here in Wisconsin. And I'm gonna turn on my camera to say hi to y'all. Uh, we have a great team here today, uh, and I want to make sure that we can introduce uh, everyone uh, to, for everyone to see each other's faces so we know we're, we're real people here. Um, so I'm joined by my colleagues, uh, Attica Scott, uh, who's an action learning coach. Hi there, Attica. Hey, Justin. Um, hey, everyone. I will be managing the uh, Q&A, so if you have any questions for our presenters throughout the webinar, please just put them in the Q&A box. Thanks, Justin. Sure thing. And uh, our other colleagues joining me today from County Health Rankings are Raquel and Carla and also James Lloyd, who will be taking care of uh, any kind of technology uh, snafus that happen during today's webinar. So if you see any of those names pop up, those are some of our, our nice folks here. Most importantly, we're also delighted to be joined by uh, Elizabeth Carrillo, who is a program manager for Health at Unidos National Latino um, their program is so much more. She has health programs that help build healthy and equitable communities, providing bilingual, culturally relevant capacity building, training, and technical assistance. So uh, I would like to welcome Liz, and she's on screen. Hi, everyone. Happy to be here. Hey, Liz. Uh, and also, Suyana Barker of La Clinica del Pueblo, which uh, she is the chief program and community services. Uh, of community services at the La Clinica, and uh, she's responsible for overseeing the design, implementation, and evaluation of programs that are culturally and linguistically, linguistically grounded. Hi, Suyana. Hi, Justin. Hi, everybody. Happy to be here, too. Excellent. So I'll uh, welcome everyone to turn their videos off so we can continue on with our slides. Um, so I want to share that we will have an exciting opportunity to kind of discuss more after our webinar today. There'll be an interactive discussion section. Uh, session. This will be totally optional, but we really invite you to join. This will be uh, facilitated by uh, one of our partners at Healthy Places by Design named Joanne Lee. Look out for uh, a way to connect to this discussion group after the webinar through a separate Zoom link at the end. So very quickly, um, I wanna get through just kind of what we're hoping to cover today on the webinar. So here are our learning outcomes. We're hoping to describe what social determinants of health uh, looks like for Latino communities in the US. And then we're looking to explore what Unidos uh, is doing to improve uh, Latino health and learn how maybe um, some of our attendees today can find and align with their local Unidos affiliates if they're not already. And then we're gonna identify how La Clinica del Pueblo is addressing uh, multiple health factors, including immigration as a social determinant of health. So very quickly, um, I wanna state uh, kind of what county health rankings role in the space is. And we really kind of think about what we do in two different ways, to improve health outcomes and to advance health equity. And very much thinking about how we're um, influencing equity in today's webinar. There's uh, many ways to connect with our county health rankings and roadmaps resources. Uh, we offer data, evidence, guidance, uh, and stories. Data to reveal the factors that influence health, evidence to focus on the strategies that work to improve it, guidance to put these strategies into action, and stories of real world experiences to inspire and inform your efforts, just like we'll hear from La Clinica today. Next, I'm gonna share just a quick new video we have to kind of talk about and explain our model. We all have a role to play in shaping our community's health. There are so many factors that influence how long we live 
and how well we live. Think of all the things that affect our health. Sure, we could all eat better, move more, and make sure we get our annual checkups. But there's more to it than that. The quality of our homes, the safety of our neighborhoods, and our chance at a good education all influence health in the short and long term. But how can we understand how all these things fit together? Meet the County Health Rankings Model. The model illustrates a broad vision for health. The model shows us that policies and programs play an important role in influencing the health factors that, in turn, shape a community's health outcomes. That means not just how long we live, but also how well we live. Health is complex. Let's see. Justin, are you still there? I think that Justin is still getting connected. Um, Attica, are you there? Yes, James, I'm here. OK, hey, everyone. <laughs> uh, here comes Justin. Oh, Justin's I'm back. back. I'm back. Did you, um, did you guys miss me? <laughs> <laughs> I apologize. Uh, I think we had what we call a technology snafu. So um, I lost connection. And I lost connection as well in Madison. Yep. All right. Are you guys uh, seeing my slides again? Yep, I see them great. OK, let's try this again, because uh, I was on a very important slide. <laughs> um, I'm just going to quickly uh, share just how we can use some of our county health rankings data to look at inequities locally. Uh, first of all, in the demographic section of your snapshot, you can look at the racial and ethnic breakdown of your own communities and also look at the rural and urban divide to get an uh, sense of what that looks like. And then we also have uh, various ranked uh, measures uh, and unranked measures to look at some gaps in your community. And these are just a highlight of a few or 10 of them here, where you can see some racial and ethnic breakdowns. What these will actually look like is um, they'll be highlighted in blue, such as the screenshot of children in poverty here. And you'll be able to see that, for example, uh, at a county level, this is Milwaukee, Wisconsin, 28% of children live in poverty. But when we break that down by race and ethnicity, we'll see how large the gaps are. 10% for white, 37% for Hispanic, and uh, about half the uh, black children in Milwaukee live in poverty. Lastly, there's just a feature on the snapshot uh, where it says Espanola on the top, where you can see your data in Spanish. But all right, since we had a little technology problem and we're a few minutes behind, I want to get right to uh, our guests today. So I want to welcome uh, Liz to the space here and make sure Liz is connected on. Liz, can we hear you? Yes, thank you, Justin. Excellent, excellent. Well, great. I'll let you carry it on from here and you can share about Unidos. Great. So um, I'll just be talking a little bit about our work around building a culture of health for Latinos. If you can go to the next slide, Justin. So first, a little bit about us. Um, we were founded in 1968 in the heyday of the civil rights movement and Chicano activism um, to pretty much give a voice to our community's concern um, and address the many bar barriers that were keeping us and continue to keeping us from thriving. Um, that continues to be our purpose today, and since then we've remained uh, a trusted nonpartisan voice for Latinos. 
Many of us know us by our former name, the National Council of La Raza, or NCLR, but in 2017, we changed our name to better resonate with and reflect the growing diversity within our community. Um, and though we changed our name, our, our mission remains the same, right? Which are seen building a stronger America by creating opportunities for Latinos. Um, we are the largest national civil rights and adv advocacy organization. And we serve the Hispanic community through research, policy analysis, our state and national advocacy efforts, um, as well as our program work in communities nationwide. Um, one of our greatest assets is uh, our affiliate network. We partner with them at nearly 300 um, affiliates across the country to serve millions of Latinos every year in the areas of civil rights and immigration, um, civic engagement, health, education, workforce, and the economy, um, and housing, basically all the social determinants of health. Next slide. Um, and our vision, as you can see, is uh, to create a strong uh, America where the economic, political, and social advancement is just a reality for all Latinos and where we can all thrive um, and ensuring that our community's contributions are recognized. One of our aims is um, to, to give voice um, to Latinos and to shape an accurate narrative on who we are. And so really part of building a culture of health is lifting up and elevating a lot of the positive cultural buffers and values that we have. Um, I'm not going to go over everything on this slide, but this is just, it lifts up a couple examples of um, how we've just lived out our mission in the last five decades. Um, on the education side, we have the largest Latino focused and Latino led charter network. Um, we also fought to extend federal minimum wage and overtime protection to nearly 2 million home care workers. Um, so really improving their own financial, um, their family's finances. And then we also have a national housing network um, that provides counseling around home ownership and also financial literacy. And we've assisted a little more than 30,000 people to buy their own homes and also keeping about 90,000 families from foreclosure. And then another aspect that we're really proud of on the health side of things is um, that we campaigned to add folic acid to corn masa flour. Um, this was a 10-year process and we worked across different sectors. We partnered with the CDC, March of Dimes, Groom, and the Walmart Corporation. But this was a major win in terms of a policy change and ensuring that many infants um, will be born without certain defects. Next slide. And so our three main pillars um, really is what we consider a, a unique advantage, right? And them working in conjunction with each other. Um, we have our policy research and advocacy work, our culturally relevant innovative programs, and then as I mentioned earlier, our network of affiliates. Um, they're all independent grassroots Latino serving and often Latino led organizations. Um, but to us as a national organization, they really represent that local footprint and they're sort of our eyes and ears, our local eyes and ears. Um, we work closely with them to learn about the, the pressing needs in communities um, and this helps inform our policy and advocacy priorities as well as develop programs that address those same issues. We um, uh, convene them and, and see our role as a capacity builder um, to just create spaces for them to foster peer learning and the sharing of best practices. Um, and just we really deeply value their community insight and work hard to lift up all their amazing efforts. Uh, many of our affiliates also implement our programs. The next slide. So this is a map of our most current um, affiliate network. We, it spans 37 states, DC and Puerto Rico. Um, and we organize them by six regions, two of which are states, California and Texas. Um, but they're, the main point that I wanna drive here is that they're really diverse, right, in every aspect, from infrastructure and capacity to just their focus. Um, they range from federally qualified health centers, so FQHCs, to Head Starts, charter schools, local development and housing corporations, um, and many that are just multi-service organizations. But while they're diverse and independent from us, they are aligned with us in our mission, right? Next slide. And Liz, I wanted to jump in just to clarify, for some folks that are completely new to the Unidos network and their affiliates locally, um, they're not always branded as Unidos, or they're often not branded as Unidos uh, organizations, right? They have different names like Centro Hispanos or um, as a clinic name or something like that, right? 
Yeah, that's a good point. In fact, none of them are branded with her name. So yeah, they're completely independent, um, local community-based nonprofit organizations. Thanks for clarifying that, Justin. Um, so on the health side of things, um, we, we aim to improve Latinos' well-being and access to timely, equitable, and quality health care. But we know that to truly build a culture of health, um, we have to go beyond health care. So we are very intentional about addressing the other social factors that influence health outcomes. Um, our health programmatic work falls under these three main areas, um, building healthy and resilient communities, again, addressing the social determinants of health, and then cultivate, cultivating leaders in health. And I'll give a couple examples later on, um, but those are broadly what they fall under. So when we began our partnership with the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, um, specifically around building a culture of health for Latinos a few years ago, we took some time to just really think about what strategies made the most sense for Unidos US um, to advance health equity in, our, in the Latino community, um, specifically keeping our affiliate network in mind. And so we landed on these five strategies um, and they help inform any future efforts, but also um, we make sure that any current eff efforts are falling under these. While they are uh, depicted as separate here, there's often a lot of overlap in our work. Um, but the first is shaping a public narrative. And this is aligned with our broader institutional priority to just advance an accurate narrative um, around our community. Um, it's something that we sought out to do just with our name change, but that has become increasingly a priority given just the national rhetoric and political climate. Um, so we, we seek to show that there's a lot of unity and solidarity within our community, but also the breadth and the diversity within our culture. Um, and with health specifically, just making sure that we approach things also from an asset-based perspective and so lifting up the strengths that we do have, such as our strong family and, and social support networks. Um, there's a lot of communications work uh, that goes on, especially in our social media, that works to sort of address this issue. And then fostering leadership and advocacy um, around key health issues for us. Um, and here we mean leadership at all levels, from our promotores de salud or community health workers, but also our executive leaders. Um, expanding where health happens, this is really where this, the social determinants of health falls under for us. Um, basically looking at issues with a health equity lens, right? So our affiliate network, for example, um, addressing the social determinants of health is very intuitive to them. It's what they've always done. They just simply don't always look at it from that perspective. So for example, one thing that we've been doing at recent convenings is just exposing um, attendees to the, the framework and the concept of health equity and, and social determinants of health. So leveraging our relationships and our partnerships with our affiliates to help just shift their mindset and try to do things a little bit differently, taking health in mind is, is top of mind for us. Um, and then the fourth is creating and sharing actionable knowledge. And here we also look at just the community insight and the best practices that's done at the local level um, as data. Um, some of our affiliates may or may not have the capacity to sort of have these robust formal evaluations. I don't know about everyone else, but I just lost Liz's voice for a second there. And uh... can you hear me now? Can people hear me? Hey, Liz, it's Attica. I could hear you the entire time, okay. so but I can't hear Justin now, but I can I hear you. I think I'm Liz. getting yes for most attendees, so I'll keep going. Um, um, but yeah, so essentially we know that the data, that a lot of their work and best practices may not be considered evidence-based, but it's still, um, they know, we know that it works, right? Community and that their practices are effective. Um, and then the last point is um, just around going back to health and healthcare, but specifically ensuring that um, our community has access to quality healthcare, um, but the utilization piece is also there, right? And that they're able to understand and then navigate the, the system. Next slide. Um, Attica, can you go to the next slide or is... Uh, uh, well, can you hear me, Liz? Uh, yes. Oh. Can you guys hear me as well? Oh. Yes, Justin. Okay. <laughs> I'm very sorry, everyone. Are you, guys, are you guys seeing the slides now? Yeah, I'm still seeing it. Okay, great. Can you advance I think one, then, Justin? Sure. I think we're caught up here. 
Is this the right place? The next one, yeah. The expanding or? Let me just, expanding where health happens, Liz? Yes, expanding where health Okay. We're there, yep. No, you may need to reshare your slides, Justin. Oh, it says I'm sharing. Okay. Um, let's try one more time. How about now? No, I'm still seeing the same one. Hey, Justin. Yeah? Can you stop share and then reshare is I think what James meant. Yeah, let me try one more time. I apologize, everyone. Let's try this again. So I'll, I'll keep talking. Um, the next slide is just a, it goes a little deeper into our expand where health happens. So sort of that third circle that you see on the screen right now. Um, and I'll give a couple examples uh, to highlight it, a couple programs of ours, but essentially uh, much of our current work focuses around addressing food insecurity, improving access to a medical and dental home for children of migrant and seasonal farm workers, and then helping increase diversity in healthcare governance. Great. And are you folks seeing the slides yet? I'm still working yes. on the background here. We are? Yeah. Great. Okay. This is great. great. Okay. So in 2017, we formed an alliance with the American Hospital Association um, around just our shared understanding of, of strength and diversity, right? And that hospital and health systems um, and their leadership should reflect the growing diversity of their patients and staff. Um, so in seeking to improve health outcomes through this diversity and governance and by also just collaborating on solutions around um, elevating the issues of youth violence, prevention and post-trauma support programs. Um, as part of our alliance, we worked on a couple key things. So a trustee match program was one of the first ones, and this is just to identify a few executive, executive leaders from our affiliate network to potentially serve on hospital boards. Um, and then a healthy, equitable and resilient communities initiative that we launched that entailed a podcast series, webinars, um, in two videos that showcased a few case studies with our affiliates that are doing just amazing cross-collaborative work in their local communities and that includes a partnership with a local hospital. Um, so our aim with this was to just uh, spread the message that community collaboration and um, these type of partnerships are key to achieving health equity. Uh, next. Next slide. All right, so just Okay, great. So um, around creating meaningful and actionable access to healthcare, I'm going to talk a little bit about our Healthy and Ready for the Future initiative. And this is funded by the Red Nose Day Fund at Comic Relief, which for those of you that uh, may see those red noses at Walgreens every April or May, this is part of that. Um, it's part of their broader work to just end child poverty by keeping children safe, healthy, and educated. Um, and with this program, we focus on um, rural areas. We are um, working with eight of our affiliates that are either Head Start, Migrant Seasonal Head Start providers or FQHCs and helping the, supporting them to essentially um, enhance current efforts to connect children with the dental home. Um, oral health is something that is often uh, not prioritized and for, for very valid reasons. So often our affiliates have to address other social determinants of health before oral health is, is addressed. Um, but we see that uh, our affiliates who use just place-based social engagement type of strategies, um, many of them use the promotor de salud model, um, are just very effective at, at implementing the initiative. Um, we've seen a lot of quantitative success, but we've also seen a lot of qualitative success, just hearing stories of children that are now more um, confident participating in class because they, they had dental work done that had just been put to the back burner for different reasons, sometimes inability to pay uh, more, most often inability to pay or just being underinsured. Um, so really making this connection between education and health 
um, taking this whole child approach is um, is really uh, is one of the focal points that we have with um, addressing just child poverty. Next slide. And then our Comprando Rico y Sano program is our signature nutrition program um, that reduces food insecurity and improves healthy shopping and healthy eating habits among Latinos. And we do this um, through the combination of nutrition education and that has several activities and a curriculum that we've developed, um, but also coupling that with SNAP enrollment assistance or SNAP the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program. It is led by community health workers or promotores de salud um, that are really the heart and soul of the program. Um, when it comes to just community health promotion efforts, trust is key. Um, so this is especially true for the Latino community. And because promotores are, are trusted members of their communities, they, you know, they understand the cultural beliefs, the attitudes, the behaviors um, of their fellow uh, community members. And they're just able to connect with program participants in a very authentic way and in a way that is transformative rather than, than transactional. Um, but separate from implementing key program activities, um, and that entails just sort of charlas or interactive uh, small educational sessions and just hands-on activities, uh, we've also encouraged them to enhance the program, leveraging whatever local resources they have um, available. Um, so many of them go above and beyond the core program activities. And then one of the things that we've also started doing as of last or two years ago was just encouraging them to um, to expand the program in their broader environment and to promote a culture of health beyond just the program activities. So some of the things that you see on screen are just a couple examples of what they've done. Next. And so currently we're implementing the program in 25 of our subgrantees. We've been implementing the program in its current form for the last six years. Last year, um, what you see on the right is just a handout with some of our key um, results. So a little bit more than 50% of participants um, made behavior change around three of, of the main aspects of the program, fruit and vegetable consumption, and then preparing healthy meals at home. Um, but aside from this, we're really proud of just the hard work that our uh, sub-grantees put in to um, assist a little over 23,000 Latinos to enroll in SNAP. And um, this is despite Right. This is in the face of uh, a lot of challenges related to just um, the national rhetoric and proposed changes to public charge. Um, so despite that fear from community members, um, our, our affiliates really just went above and beyond and they um, expanded outreach uh, strategies. They um, really just had this culturally responsive approach um, and leverage their community trust to just put out the right and accurate information and at the end of the day motivate families to make whatever decision makes the most sense for them and sometimes that meant just uh, prioritizing the immediate well-being of, of their children for example and putting food on their table um, so through our close collaboration with them we were able to provide them with some of that accurate information right in real time about proposed changes just like know your rights type of information and just other resources. Next slide. So now that I've talked a little bit about some of our programmatic examples, at least related to health, I want to shift a little on, on just our broader partnership with the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, RWJF. And, and Liz, can you yes. hear me? This is Attica. Yes. Um, before you um, continue, we actually have a few questions that folks have. Can we pause for just a moment to see if you can respond to some of those questions? Sure. Okay, great. So um, Raquel had asked in the chat, what are some examples from your own communities of how you are advancing equity, um, especially in uh, with uh, Latino populations? And so um, you have uh, a health educator in Oklahoma. Hello, um, Attica? Her voice bounced off for me for a minute too. Can, can you hear me, Liz? Yes. All right, I'm sorry about all the, the technological complications, everyone. Why don't you uh, keep on going ahead and we'll, we'll catch Attica when she jumps back in. Okay. 
Um, so um, just some of our broader work with, with RWJF, right? We, we collectively believe that everyone should have the opportunity, opportunity and ability to, to be healthy, no matter where they live, um, where they're born or how much they earn. And so because the Latino population is increasing, you know, we believe that a healthier America depends upon Thanks, Liz. Yeah. In, in the summer of 2016, um, when we were developing the five strategies that I mentioned earlier, we conducted a virtual town hall with our affiliates to just learn a little bit more about local factors that were impacting health and well-being among, among families. And as you can see, economic opportunities and access to jobs came up on top, followed by access to affordable, healthy food and physical activity. Um, one thing that we also saw was just the trauma related to immigration experience or status. And now this is before the 2016 election, so it's safe to assume that the 41% um, is much higher now. Right? But that's something that I just wanted to mention. And then the next slide. So uh, the next slide. Another aspect that we assessed were just factors um, related to the healthcare system. And um, Suyana from, or Dr. Barker from La Clinica del Pueblo, this is probably no surprise to her, um, and probably many of you too, but affordability and just insurance coverage came up on top when it comes to just factors related to the healthcare system. And so we know that there were many gains with the ACA in terms of coverage for Latinos, but those that are undocumented or in mixed status families um, still remain under uninsured or, or underinsured at best. Um, and then the issue of utilization and understanding just preventive services or even just the complex healthcare system overall was also ranked second. The next slide. Okay. Um, if we can go past two, yeah. So that's what I was just talking about now. Um, and then the next slide, which I'll just start talking about it. So um, this was in 2016, right? This virtual town hall, but just recently in, in early 2009, we wrapped up a process of just conducting a, a capacity assessment around the social determinants of health among our um, affiliate network. Um, and this was just to, to build upon just better understanding our affiliate network with regards to their understanding of and interest in promoting a culture of health framework within their organizations and within their communities. Um, so we, um, the assessment entailed an online survey and then four focus groups and key informant interviews. The um, overall sample size was representative of our, of our network with a 90% confidence level and the online service in particular had 60 unduplicated respondents from 56 of our affiliates. Um, the four fo focus groups had 22 participants from 20 affiliates. And in fact, one was conducted in Spanish and was facilitated by, by Justin, actually. Um, next. Thanks, Liz. Are you able to hear me? I know I've been popping yes. on and off here with complications. Um, I just want you to get to the slides. I think it's very important, yep. so go ahead. Okay. <laughs> So what we saw was that throughout the various collection points of the assessment, and we worked with an external consultant on this, but what came up time and time again were just that issues of immigration policy um, and the political climate and how it creates fear and confusion for immigrants and their families. It just emerged as pervasive themes, um, especially around having a, a very real impact on um, just being able to access needed services. And so what, the visual that you see here are the eight major social determinants of health that um, were found within that assessment, um, were found across our affiliate network from the assessment, but we have immigration policy at the center um, because it just really intersected with every, every one of the other seven social determinants of health. Um, so it, it, it's probably no surprise for many of you that are in, in, in the day-to-day -day in the community work, but it was, um, it was a finding that we were just able to back up with data. Slide. And Liz, I just want to highlight that this is um, representative nationally of organizations, affiliate organizations. Um, so, you know, it's important to see this uh, key theme coming up as this um, immigration policy uh, in the center. Um, I'm going to skip a slide or two, Liz, just so we can make mm -hmm. sure that I know we've had some issues. Um, 
and uh, want to get to um, maybe just a couple of your closeout slides so we can sure. have time um, for Suyana. Sure. Yeah. So um, beyond just our work with the building of culture of health, I guess what I would just want to leave, leave you with is just remembering that we all have some level of, of power to help advance health equity, you know, whether that be as individuals or within our organizations and communities. Um, whether you are located in a system or in a community that serves many or few Latinos, um, just identifying shared values and assets that, that help foster collaboration in authentic and accurate ways is important. Um, also utilizing just a local multi-stakeholder collaborative approach, right? Um, advancing health equity is complex and multifaceted, so we, we can't make progress um, if we don't go at it alone, right? Um, and then just enhancing the role of local community leaders to support efforts is also really important. Um, community efforts, you know, should be community driven to be sustainable and, and truly transformative. Um, we've leveraged the Promotor de Salud model for over two decades. It's a tried and true model in the Latino community and we see great success in it across our affiliates, including La Clinica del Pueblo. Um, when they leverage their promotores as agents of change for health issues, but also even just beyond health. Um, so with this and just thinking of being agents of change, um, we recently launched our Adelante Moving Us Forward campaign. It's a year-long campaign um, intended to just strengthen the power and influence of the Latino community in the 2020 election and beyond. Um, as I mentioned, we're a growing population and will represent a rising electoral force. Um, if you want to learn a little bit more about just anything that I've talked about today, um, including Adelante, um, just check us out on our website or also follow us on our social media. Thank you, Liz. Uh, there's been an incredible wealth of content here and I, I think it's uh, been really great and I apologize again for the tech issues here, but um, we're going to hear a local example of what this kind of looks like with Suyana. So I don't know if you want to cure her up for us. Sure. Um, so Suyana, Dr. Barker is from one of our DC based, um, like, Justin mentioned All-Star Affiliates, La Clinica del Pueblo. They actually implement Comprando Rico y Sano um, and have also just partnered with us on an array of issues. So um, you're in great hands, so take it away. See ya. Thank you, Liz, and thank you, Justin, uh, for inviting me to be here with you guys. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. So I'm going to um, go a little fast here in my presentation so we can have some space to dialogue and you guys can always ask questions and um, I think Justin is going to dialogue with me too, so we can make this a dynamic presentation. So for those who don't know, La Clinica del Pueblo is a federally qualified health center, but we started as a volunteer-run clinic in uh, 1983 in response to the first Salvadorian immigrant wave that came to U.S., or at least for the D.C. metropolitan area. In 1985, we incorporated as an independent nonprofit, and in 2007, we become a federally qualified health center. We have like five strategic direction, and as you guys can see, advocacy is one of them. So um, um, the idea is uh, not only high quality or, or, or innovation or data or strategic thinking is enough, we also need advocacy. It's a little bit what I'm going to be talking about here with you guys today. Our uh, mission is to build a Latino, um, 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 a healthy Latino community. And something about La Clinica, we are a federally qualified health center, but our concern is with the Latino community in the C metropolitan area. We cannot serve all of them, but we have the whole community as our, um, we are worried with the whole community. In our vision, we say that healthcare is a human right. So part of our advocacy and how we affirm what we do is understanding that healthcare should be for everybody, not for a, a segment of the population. In our values, you think health equity is a big one. Right, um, and as you can see, we talk about how to involve community, how to be perseverant, how to work in collaboration, how to be maintain enthusiasm, even in a moment of crisis as we are now. And all of this providing quality um, healthcare. Uh, to give an idea, we serve, the majority of people that we serve are limited English speaking. So we are, uh, the majority of the people that we serve are uh, Hispanic. They identify themselves as Hispanic. Um, and we have a, 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 a good 40% almost that are uninsured uh, and did not qualify for any health insurance um, uh, with the um, ACA. 
Um, the majority of, of the people that we serve is also for Central America. It's sometimes a little bit different than other uh, states. Um, we do serve people from the Northern Triangle, El Salvador, Honduras, and um, Guatemala are the biggest um, group that we serve. Uh, uh, in order to deal with that or deal with that, La Clinica start um, uh, thinking more and more and more that immigration is a social structural determinant of health. So I put this slide out there so to make a little fun of what, how we feel. I mean, all of us are dealing with the social determinant of health. Or all of us are understanding how lack of uh, basic um, conditions make people um, having a hard time to deal with their um, 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 we have issues that uh, we cannot really prevent, right? I mean, all of us are going to have a health problem in our lives sooner or later. But for, for some of us, it's really hard to navigate or to overcome the health condition. And then our life become um, with less quality and we die earlier. When we think about immigrants, especially immigrants who are not considered part of the community, they become also a special problem because we don't have um, we cannot access all the programs that can alleviate poverty or can deal with the social determinant of health. So the lack of immigration status adjustment becomes this rock that we can push up um, alongside with unemployment and housing problems and transportation problems and access to healthy food. So in order to do that, besides this understanding that we have, La Clinica develop a model that we believe is having good outcomes. We believe they have good outcomes because we have um, 80 percent of people live with diabetes with their diabetes under control and we have almost 90 percent of retention to care for people living with HIV. Of those retained to care, 85 percent are virus suppressed. So we have those data who tell us that we have a good outcome and in, to make sure we have those good outcomes, we create a system that's based on those five um, points that this slide is showing to you. We provide comprehensive primary care and wraparound services on, across the life spectrum. We also have in the same um, facility uh, in, um, integrated the mental health substance use treatment. We have a program who provide medical interpretation and language access services. And we have our community health program that include health communication strategies and safe space for special um, segments of our community. And we have our advocacy uh, program. La Clinica on, on that end, and, I, and we have programs and services, and you can see that what we call safe spaces are special spaces <laughs> that are designed to serve populations that are more um, at risk. We have Entre Amigas, uh, Among Girlfriends, that are a safe space for women survivors of gender-based violence. This can be domestic violence, but also human trafficking, and work-related gender-based violence. And this space help women to understand their problem, understand their condition, and navigate the systems. Not only the health system, but many times legal systems and also social services systems and poverty alleviation programs. We have Empoderative, which is a safe space for the LGBTQ community. We serve men, uh, men who have sex with men and transgender women, who uh, also need a space to feel empowered and then be able to navigate the system. We have Volvinda Vivir, which is a program for people who is, are dealing with substance use and need also a safe space to overcome their um, situation. And we have Mire Fugio, which is a space for youth newcomers. This is a school-based program for um, newly immigrants. Uh, also, we have La Clinica Insubvenzidario. That's all our prom health promotion programs that go uh, and do a lot of community um, um, programs. The community programs actually, um, they touch more people than our clinical program. We, can, we are able to serve around 5,000 people uh, in our clinical services between primary health care and mental health. And when we go to the community, we count this on touches and it's around 80,000 touches uh, per year. So we have an uh, incredibly uh, extended program that's community-based. This community-based approach, this is based in action. We don't have only a community health approach, we have a community health action approach. Um, the community health action approach is based on those concepts that have been kind of shared with you guys so far. One is language access. We make sure if our promotoras de salud go to a town hall, they have interpreters with them. So they, produce, they have capacity to interact with people even though they are not 
um, uh, fully bilingual. We have the community-based health promotion activities. Those are a combination of education and, edu and um, can be one-on-one, -on -one, can be group, can be also uh, community um, campaigns, um, health education campaigns. We have our community mobilization advocacy um, efforts that's a creation of space for dialogue. We have, we put together community forums, we put uh, space for dialogue and we organize um, special events so people can come and discuss issues with us. For example, recently we had an event that discussed immigration and um, uh, climate crisis. We brought people from, uses Zoom, we brought people from El Salvador to discuss with us the water crisis in El Salvador and how this has impacted immigration pattern that we are seeing here in DC. We have the safe spaces that I mentioned to you guys for special populations. Safe spaces are spaces that are not clinical, but they are not also social services. Those are just a place that people hang. And from here, from where, and in one of the safe spaces right now, from here, we help people to access the services that they need to improve their health. And then we do this through a navigation problem, uh, program. We do not refer people to places. We pretty much um, navigate people to places. And it's all peer-based. And we use promotores de salud, uh, e promotores, promotores e promotores de salud to help our clients to navigate the system. I don't know if I'm going too fast. Justin, let me know. If I'm no, ready oh, this is fantastic. I just want to highlight how you, um, just your organization is obviously inherently working in the equity space, but the level of um, community engagement and resident engagement in all the ways you just uh, exemplified is, is really, you're, you're really a model for this work. So I, I appreciate you sharing. And I think that this next bit about communications is part of that too. Thank you. So um, this is an example for you guys. We, uh, this is a, a program that we create. It's called uh, Saludo, Saludes Conocerte, meaning as uh, health is know yourself. And we create some um, kind of um, very local ways to tell people to eat well, to do more exercise, and to uh, enhance their capacity to express themselves. And the capacity to express themselves, that's saludenate, que es saludarte, <laughs> is part of the make sure you don't get isolated, make sure you don't get depressed, make sure you have people around you so we can deal with the um, mental health issues related to chronic disease or any other um, disease that we may see our community being um, affected by. Uh, our community mobilization, this is also, if you can see the picture there, we always do our community uh, mobilization, ask people what they think is health and what they think is the barriers for them to be healthy. Uh, we, our approach is not tell people how to behave, not tell people how to, what they should do to be healthier, but asking them why they're not feeling themselves healthy and what we could be done and what should be done to change that. Um, and thus, this idea of dialoguing with the community about how they perceive their health and what they think should be done is what transform sorrow to solidarity. So we, all the community mobilization that we do, we try to make people don't feel guilt or trapped or victimized by um, the system or their own behavior and create the solidarity approach to make sure we can deal with issues. The solidarity includes um, partnerships and we need partnerships to deal with the immigration issues. So medical legal partnerships are very important Advocacy is very important too, to make sure legal services are available to people. Um, and um, we need to, to, and this has helped us to create a, a system of resilience that helps people to work better um, on their way to be healthy. Um, the challenges that we see is, I, I bet, similar to the challenge that everybody's seeing. Um, the current anti-immigrant rhetoric is really killing us. <laughs> We don't feel safe anywhere. And also it's sometimes hard for us to even take care of ourselves, to take care of our clients because um, we feel very um, um, unsettled recently. So the, the whole, the other challenge is the how healthcare is financed, uh, is based in, in some kind of segments of the, the community who has the right to it instead of healthcare considered a uh, human right. And uh, today's, uh, uh, International Human Rights Day, so healthcare is a human right, and I think we should um, affirm that over and over and over. We cannot have a fair society if some people do not have access to healthcare. 
gentrification is a really problem in our area. DC is gentrifying very fast and um, our community is being pushed out of their um, neighborhoods. Um, and also the fact that we deal with all the, the fringes, right? Where we, we are very community based and we serve the ones most at need. We are seeing like xenophobia, racism, transphobia and homophobia and sexism as a combination of things. So we see that different systems is um, putting our community in a corner and we need to bring them back to, to, the, to the light with us. So what we do is try to, to work what the, the actions, right? As we call it. So, um, so Yana, have, Yana um, you've, uh, your challenges that you've explained are, are really relevant and important. And I want to make sure that you, I know because we're tight on time, touch especially on, um, on, on one in particular, which um, is the advocacy and coalitions work that you did here. Could you explain that? Yeah, so um, the, the slide before is the action in solidarity. So I just, um, we cannot, like, like clinical, we, we consider ourselves small, so we never do things alone. And many times we uh, join other social movements in, in solidarity. So the picture there is us joining all the sanctuary city movement in DC to make sure we don't have um, ICE, um, uh, uh, make us unsafe in DC. So we join actions in solidarity. We march with people. We have La Clinica presence in vigils, in march, in any kind of um, uh, movement that we've, we are asking for a fair society, La Clinica goes together. Um, the other way is the advocacy in coalitions is the other action that we do. This is, um, we never do advocacy by ourselves too. We always have coalitions that we join. We ask people to join our coalitions when we start someone. And this, I just brought this example for you guys recently. The, we did this incredibly um, push into the DC uh, budget season to enhance the amount of um, resources for legal representation for immigrants. Uh, we join all the legal service providers and we ask the mayor to enhance the budget on immigration. And we, we were able to, in many of the meetings with the mayor, bring the word immigration as the most important uh, word in our budget process. And we are able to enhance um, uh, the, the budget that we had from $900,000 to two million and a half. So we thought it was a huge win for us. And for us, it's very important because then those legal services providers can see our clients. And then we can deal with one of the social determinants of health that's providing legal um, assistance to our clients. And finally, we try to integrate messages and brand. La Clinica adopted the butterfly, that's the, the immigration symbol, and adopted the message that no human being is illegal. And we are integrating this in everything that we do so people feel, know that can, it's safe to be around us and, and not feel threatened and know that we can protect them too. And also integrating, for example, this year that we have a photo there of our pride parade, La Clinica, participate on the Pride Parade, and we made the No Human Being is Illegal our um, uh, message for the Pride Parade. So um, in this way, we made the community who is sensible to the LGBT rights understand the immigrants also need rights. All human beings should be considered legal. Um, and this is the other approach that we have. We try not to segment our issues and make, um, but we integrate them with everything that we do and include everyone that we serve into this um, mixed way of seeing the struggles that we have and the solutions that we may propose. Um, so uh, Yana, I think mm -hmm. that's, uh, that's fantastic how you shared the solutions to these challenges and there's this resonating um, message I'm getting about uh, unity and, and the, how comprehensive your work is and it kind of re threads right into Unidos and that strength of um, being unified in these in these um, messages here about the work you're doing. So um, I just want to thank you very much for sharing that, your community's example, and I'm just going to kind of roll us along because we're pretty tight on time, but I, I appreciate sure. um, your wonderful examples and, and thanks for sharing about La Clinica. Um, so quickly, I know we're down to the last two minutes here on the webinar. Um, and we're not gonna have time for Q&A really at all here, but we do have the discussion group that we can move to if people have questions they wanna work on. We will be sharing these slides, of course, and just a few last things from County Health Rankings here. Just um, uh, alerting folks again about our partner centers,
so they can learn about how to engage better with uh, organizations like La Clinica or other affiliate um, community-based organizations of Unidos. Um, they can visit our partner center to see uh, maybe in the um, nonprofit section on how best to connect with those. Uh, I just want to highlight quickly that we have a new resource called uh, Action Learning Guides, uh, which give uh, little kind of tutorials on thinking about health equity or thinking about resident engagement or thinking about root causes or, or thinking about how to uh, best work in partnerships. So these are just another resource that we're going to link to and share as well. Uh, we want to hear from everyone. So please um, take the chance here to click on the link that's being shared uh, to uh, fill out an evaluation about today's webinar. Um, Please don't evaluate us on our technical difficulties as much as our content and our and our guests that were here and really how we can better learn perhaps from uh, the shared experience. Um, so we're going to skip the Q&A because we simply do not have time, but that segues into how we can join um, a further discussion. So um, there's a link that's going to be shared where you can sign into a separate um, Zoom window that we're going to have a discussion group here to talk about a lot of these issues, things uh, associated with um, immigration as a social determinant of health, uh, things like um, public charts, things like how to engage the Latino community better locally. So please join us uh, on that link uh, and we appreciate you for doing that. I want to give a huge thank you to both um, uh, Elizabeth Carrillo of Unidos and also uh, Suyana Barker of La Clinica for taking their time and sharing um, the excellent um, background they did and most importantly the ways in which they can um, help build um, learning and awareness about how to move action forward in the Latino community to support improved health, especially in a time when it's challenged. So I appreciate um, their time and uh, we hope to maybe have them uh, on again. And, and I thank you all for joining us this afternoon. Please come to the discussion group and uh, thanks again from County Health Rankings and Unidos and have a wonderful afternoon. Good afternoon, everybody. Thanks, Oyana.